the Hillcrest Church video. We hope this message will help you grow. Good morning, friends. Delighted to see you. If I haven't met you, uh, my name's Christian Lindbeck, very grateful lead pastor here. Aren't you glad that we are not ignoring the realities of the world, that this church and the kingdom of God is um, involved, that we carry our heart and our conviction out somewhere? Um, Aaron and his team go into tough places that few of us would have the courage, I think just the heart and the fortitude to do. But we're with you, heart, mind, soul, resources, and we thank you for your faithfulness. And um, I want it to be an encouragement to you that uh, we, the church, universal, and we, this church right here, don't pretend or ignore or brush aside, but we look at the difficult things that are happening around us, and we are on mission to bring God's shalom, peace, and His restoration to those places. So thank you for being a part of that. Um, Jesus was, was pretty clear, sometimes terrifyingly so, that the genuine condition of our hearts and our true grasp of the truth would be best displayed in the ways that we love the most vulnerable around us. And so we pray that we would be that kind of people all the time, but especially at Christmas as we celebrate discuss and dwell in this idea that God did not just handle things from afar, but came to participate in, to be with, to understand, to grasp, to experience what it's like to be a human being. May we embody His mission in the same kinds of ways, um, entering into these spaces. Lord, we pray that our hearts would always be open, but especially at Christmas. And so, so how about that, by the way? It's Christmas. Like... <laughs> Uh, yeah, sometimes I have to say it again. It's Christmas. It's here. Um, I, I, I don't know. I feel like every year I say, I feel like everybody's like, I can't believe it's Christmas already. What are we getting over? Like, it's the same time every year. Um, I, my wife said, I think she's right. I think that we might be getting over a childish anticipation. We're still shedding this idea. When we're a kid, it takes forever to get to Christmas. When will it come? You know, finally another week, I'll die, right? Uh, and then when you grow up, it just comes like any other string of days. And so it can kind of catch you off guard. And it's so full of intention and expectation that, again, I think sometimes when it arrives, we can't process that there are 16 days until Christmas. 16. That is 16 more days to shop. And 16 more days to prep, and 16 more days to host parties and to attend parties, and 16 more days to buy white elephant gifts until those go away in Jesus' name, and 16 more days for party favors, and 16 more days to complete your finals and finish school, and 16 more days to cut down a tree and put up lights. All those things are right now. That's now. And my question for you this morning that I want to begin with is, so how does that make you feel? How do you feel when I say there are 16 more days till Christmas? There's not particularly a right answer to the how does it make you feel, but I'm interested that I think we've been taught, in particular in the church, to not trust our emotions. Uh, to not ask ourselves how we feel about things, how we're handling it. And it may be that as a generation or as a time, we're overly dependent on our emotions, but be certain of this, our emotions matter. It is our Creator who made us with emotions. We are emotional beings. Our emotions influence the way we think. If you think our thoughts are pure, think again. Uh, often what we love and what we're doing, these are influencing the way we think about things. We've been created with emotion. Our emotions influence and color the way we go about our world. Our, how we feel matters in this moment. And i got to tell you, Christmas, the season is jammed with feeling. Like it evokes feeling. It is compacted season of feelings. And so it's a good question. How do you feel? Can I, can I ask you to do something? Can you just check in with that for a second? I'm going to give you a moment. Pause. If you write down in a journal or a community card or a scrap of paper or a gum wrapper, I'm just going to ask you one more time. How do you feel when I say it's two weeks till Christmas? Write down the first few words that come to mind for you. Just scratch them down somewhere. I see nobody writing, so let me try again. Just write down the first few words that come to you. Just, write, just be honest. What few words come to you? 
Anybody have the courage to call out a couple? What couple of words pop into your mind when I think, just call them out? Panic. Pa panic. Thank you. I know you said it with some verve too. I like that. What's another one? Grateful. Grateful. Good. Any other words just popping? What's that? Nauseous. Nauseous. <laughs> Honest. Don't worry, I'm not attaching names. Can I get one more? What is it? Hungry. But that has some deep meanings all kinds of ways. Isn't that funny? I think that all I wanted to get at was all the juxtaposition of things that are true. Uh, it fills me with all those two, hope and gratitude and hunger for food and hunger for the Lord and <laughs> hungry for reality, all the hungers, right? Uh, but also um, anxious. And it's this complicated mixture, the spectrum of emotions that goes somewhere from like genuine anticipation, joyful anticipation of family and gifts to outright dread, like of circumstances or people or moments. And it's kind of all the way in between. I don't, I don't know if you are as broken as Jen and I, but I promise that sometime in the next two weeks, we will look at each other and really honestly say something like, next year, let's just go to Hawaii. She's not, and sit very, very still <laughs> in the sun. Uh, because, like, again, it just packs so much into a tiny window. And I, I understand that for some people, this season will be 90% good. But for some, it will be 90% bad. It will be um, a stinging reminder of what isn't. And I think for most of us, it's going to be a whole range of those. So to be honest about it, it's going to change in the moment. It's going to change how we're feeling, and it impacts how we're processing these extraordinary true things of what we say about Jesus and what this Christmas is all about. That's why in our communication for this series, we've tried to be honest. If you look carefully at it, I don't know if you noticed that we've combined words like in the ribbon, it says cynical, drained, anxious, and irritated, and that it is covered with these things that are equally and also are overwhelmingly true. Love, joy peace and hope, that these things live jumbled together, and at times we may honestly really feel all these things. It's still a good question. What do you, what do you feel? Because we will feel hopeful, but even the best among us will feel cynical sometimes. Things, things are gonna be, you're, something's going to create an eye roll, probably the shopping mall, but something will make you roll your eyes. We will be joyful, but also drained. This is a season where depression tends to be high, just kind of worn out. We will love the people around us, like really love them. And also they will be irritating because people are messy and situations are complicated and we're emotionally thin and expectations, high expectations are easily missed. And so it just means these realities live together. And one that we thought was probably obvious in this season, and just could possibly come up, we want to be honest about it, is that while we are in the season of proclaiming that the Prince of Peace has come and He has brought peace to the world, that we can also look around and observe that there is peace missing and then see in our own heart we do not feel at peace. While we declare the truth about the Prince of Peace, like, wild anxiety and runaway thoughts are running through our mind. And we have to talk about how do we handle this just real living juxtaposition between what is true about peace and what is true about the way we feel. And, I, and the thing is, is that uh, as we talk about anxiety and peace, the church has a complicated history with talking. As the tide of anxiety rises around us, Again, the church has, a comp has had kind of complex reactions to it. At times, the church has been a true lifeline of hope about what is true. But I think the church has to admit that it has also mixed up serious and common mental health disorders with something like you just don't trust God enough. And those things are not the same. Or sometimes we have supplied trite and unhelpful answers like, well, here's what's true, so now just be better. Like, I told you what's true, so now you should just feel better about that. Uh, sometimes we shame people for feeling anxious. We'll tell, like, uh, it's a sin to not trust God, or we'll, or we'll ignore the problem. This doesn't happen in the church, and so we kind of scoot it away. Now, I hope you find at Hillcrest we talk about this. Uh, because it is a rising tide. It's a, it is a worthwhile topic to talk about how we, how we really handle 
uh, anxiety as Christians in the season. I just want to say, if the church has done that, we, the church, have done that, I'm sorry. It's a true apology. If it's been brushed off or oversimplified answers have been given to you, I mean it. That is a genuine apology from me. Um, may we do better with this. Before I say much more about it and get myself in too much trouble, I'd just like to offer three more quick things. Thing number one, and probably the most important, I am not an expert. We have experts in our church. They have taught. Remember when Tim and Christy taught? Christy is an expert. Kelly Furlan is an expert. Matt is an expert. We have experts, and they have taught, and they will teach again. I'm not an expert, but I am profoundly interested for myself and for the church, because as I love Jesus' flock along with him, I can go out and plainly read another report that says this is the largest health issue in America. 40 uh, million Americans dealing with disabling anxiety. More than 18% of the population are family and friends and children's and children's children and parents and people that we go to church with. So this morning, I want to talk about kind of normally dealing with anxiety while admitting there may be way more complex issues for which you should absolutely seek help without shame. But for the people who experience anxiety, less than 30%, actually, I think it's just over 30%, seek help. And it is common and it is treatable. Second thing I want to say is I have learned to thrive with anxiety. I am an anxious person. Now, I say this every time we talk about this topic, not to just keep confessing the same thing, but I think anytime I'm going to open my mouth about anxiety, I want you to hear, I understand. Uh, I also want to knock down any facade that there's a certain kind of person that struggles with anxiety. Um, I want you to also know that people will come to me later and say, I want to help, like, have you prayed about this? Or, you know, uh, have you, are you seeking help? Look, I have prayed, I have sought the Lord, I have good theology, I have wonder and joy and happiness, I live my life aligned with Jesus, but I still start most of my days anxious, and, and sometimes profoundly so, like badly anxious. I think it's just worth saying out loud that um, I have learned to live my life thriving in the truth and still be this person. And that's why I think it's key for us to say number three, I think we should neither shame nor surrender to anxiety. So if we say, like, we don't shame it, it's, uh, we talk about it, we understand that it's there, there are people with this, I have learned to thrive myself in the midst of anxiety, but as Christians we don't just say, so be it, and there you will be. But we hold out a hope. I hold out a hope that God is working something in me as he deals with the root issues that cause anxiety and the traumas that could be at the base of that. I trust the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit rises in me anxiousness as he is dealing with things that are inside of me. And I can be in the process of being anxious and not surrendering to that entirely, trusting that God is developing something in me and hoping for total transformation. I love that the Bible is honest about it. Over and over, you're going to see me or hear me say today, I love how many times the Bible mentions don't be worried or anxiety, because not because it's ashamed of it, but precisely because it understands this is part of the human experience. And so it's brought up over and over. Psalm 94, 18 says, When I said, my foot is slipping, it was your unfailing Lord that supported me. And when anxiety is great within me. It is your consolation that brought and brings me joy. We can count on the Lord to interact in the honest truth of that juxtaposition between anxiety and peace. So all of those caveats aside, I just want to spend a few moments asking another question. So then how do we discuss and even experience peace inside the hurry of Christmas. Like, how do we? How do we begin to experience peace in complicated emotions in the midst of this busy season? I want to start by talking about imagination. Now, when I first say imagination, it might sound weird because we think, I think our first thought when I say imagination is make-believe, to make something up. 
But what I don't, I don't mean make up by imagination. I mean what Merriam-Webster allows in imagination. That imagination is the act or the power of forming a mental image about something that is true that is not currently present to my senses or that I have never wholly ever perceived. That I can hold something in my mind that it can still be true out there. I haven't wholly seen it or I have never seen it yet. Which is just a massive part of Christianity for us. Do you remember last week Tim read from Puddle Glum who couldn't remember that Narnia had ever existed. But he essentially said, I will imagine it as long as I need to live like a Narnian until I die, right? And there is a measure of Christianity in which is I, I did not get to bodily see Jesus or see him resurrected. I read the historical testimony. I receive the witness of the Holy Spirit, and I have faith for this thing that I have not yet seen, and I truthfully imagine it. It is the truthful imagination that helps me hold it in place. Jesus said this, John 20, 29. He says, look, blessed are you because you saw me and you believed in me, right? That's a good thing. He says, because you see me, you believe me. He says, but blessed are those who will not see me and yet believe. They will need to be established and established in what's true, do truthful imagination about what is all that is real. And so I think Tim and I, throughout this series, as we talk about what's true and hopeful and peaceful and good, is that we are saying we want to take what these things that we know to be true and create ways for us to slow down together and slow down individually, that we can take what we know, what is truthful, and occupy it in our heart, in our emotion. That we don't just hold these things to be true solely as head information, but that we experience the truth of them that we occupy the truth, that we dwell in what is true. And that means even when the other emotions do not change, when the emotions are still messy, it doesn't mean we cannot settle into these things that are fundamentally true. And we think that as a practice, we're going to find together that what it takes for that kind of settling and dwelling and occupying in what is true is intention, time, and truthful imagination. To help myself do that, um, like I said, I, I wrestle with anxiety, so I have all kinds of ways I manage that. One of the things that I do on an almost daily basis is ask myself a series of three questions, but in particular, if anxiety is rising up for me. And those three questions go like this. What is true? What is good? And what is next? What is true? What is good? And what is next? Now, we have to start with what is true. In fact, let me just establish this, that you can't really figure out how you feel about anything and land authentically in that space until you know what's true. Uh, You can't truthfully imagine without truth. In fact, imagination unhinged from what is true is weak support. But imagination about what is true, hard facts equal hard comfort. And that means even when our feelings don't true, truth can be the bedrock that provides proper emotional context. This is how I feel. Here is what is true. And here is an emotion that is true in the midst of this other messy emotion. And it is truth that grounds imagination. I can tell you, my fellow worriers know this. It is imagination unhinged from truth that is the most dangerous tool of anxiety. Right? The what if, but maybes. It is when imagination unhinged from truth gets carried away that particularly we start worrying about what is coming next. So it is truthful imagination connected to something that is foundationally true that works. This is precisely Why? Setting down what is true so that we can imagine it is better done in advance and not when we're in trouble. I'm not suggesting that you can't establish what's true when you're anxious, but it's kind of like trying to establish calm when bullets are whizzing over your head. Uh, That's why as Christians, 
We don't just as a practice sit down to read what is true in the Word of God, spend time with the one who is true, and be convicted of the truth by the Holy Spirit. We're grounding ourselves in truth so that when trouble arises, we're not finding it, we're rehearsing it, right? When it rises up, then I go back and say, here's what's try rehearse the gospel truth over myself. I think that is when the kinds of familiar words that are sometimes used like a blunt weapon against those who are anxious actually begin to settle in true. Perhaps when you've been anxious before, somebody gave you Philippians 4, be anxious about nothing. Just be better. Now, I want you to know that this is written by a man who frequently talks about his own anxiety. Is that a cheer happening back there? <laughs> Football game on somewhere? Sweet. Um, <laughs> just go ahead and grab it. I think that when you're operating out of that, when you know what's true, then you rehearse these words, and instead of being a weapon, they're a salve. Let me read then Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and it will speak true as you speak to your own heart. I, I love that you're not, I think I hear Paul praying these words over us to you and for himself. He, he's gonna, I'll read another part in this letter where he speaks about his own anxiety. Do not be anxious about anything. In other words, don't settle in. Don't let anxiety be your only thought about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends understanding, and I might add emotion and circumstance, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Good biblical advice from a man who understands anxiety. Knowing what is true in the moment is best rehearsed from what you already know to be true. But I want to admit to you that I still find, even if I know it's true, I still find it really difficult in the moment where my mind is racing away from me to land in what's true, even though I've spent my whole life studying it. And so I want to give you a simple exercise that I use. People came up and told me their exercises. Here's just mine today. Uh, take it and see if it's helpful to you. When my mind is racing and I need to rehearse what is true, um, I run a simple little exercise about landing back in the truth called adjust the scale of context. Now, I know I've given it a super interesting name, but let me explain it for a second. Uh, when you're reading a scripture verse and the verse is confusing or challenging or scares you, the first thing you do is instead of getting all caught up in the verse is you just expand the context out to the paragraph. And then you expand the context out to the book. And then you expand the context out to the author. And then you expand the context out to the testament. And then you expand the context out to the whole Bible. And somewhere in there, you're going to settle this kind of anxiety you have over this verse and its context. Well, it turns out handling our own emotion shares a similar uh, uh, process. And that is if we take our moment, at any given moment, do I have that little scale? I might be feeling in this moment like uh, surrender, give up, run away, it's too much. And in that moment, th that might be how I feel. And the exercise that I do is I move up and out in the scale of context as far as I need to to emotionally land in a place where I remember what is true. And I want to go as just as far up as I need to, because if you always have to go to the end, that will always be your default, right? Right now, I feel rotten or anxious or afraid. What if I just go out to how I felt on Tuesday? What about how this falls into this month? What about how this falls in the season of my life? What's true about this season of my life? What's true about my family? Uh, maybe sometimes I have to go all the way out to what's true about my life with Jesus. They're starting to get into some big things, but I can't tell you how many times I've grounded on, well, Jesus saved me from certain death. He's given me back each day as a gift. This is the truth I'm going to land in. But it may be that you have to go out to your whole life, or it may be that out of that scope, notice that long line that goes forward, you have to go all the way out into eternity. <laughs> like, uh, I may never know this answer, but I know what's true about my trillions of years to follow. And my advice is that when you're looking for what's true, you move up and out as far as you need to in that context until you can stop and say, here's what is greater true about my circumstance. Settle in for a moment into what is true. 
In that moment, carry through the emotions. Talk to your own soul about it. Psalm 42 says, beginning in verse 5, I love that he says, bringing his own emotions, he rehearses again what is true. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, from the heights of Hermon. I will remember you. And when you reach that point that you can ground yourself in what is true again as you move out enough, take time to dwell there. This is where truthful imagination comes into play. Soon as you arrive, spend time dwelling on the truth. Truthfully imagine what is there. Do not rush away. Don't run away from your emotions on the way there, and don't run away once you get there. Oh, got it settled. Take time to dwell in that moment. Where Paul said, do not be anxious, do you remember the next part of his advice in verses 8 and 9? He says, once you have arrived at truth, here's his advice. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And what they have seen with Paul is that he knows how to walk through the difficulty of life. He is writing to people who know him, who have heard his anxious thoughts, who have seen him submit it to truth. Uh, They know and have perceived, so he is writing from a place of understanding. Dwell on these things that are true. And once you have arrived at what is true, the next good question is to ask yourself, what is good? If such and such is true about the overall picture, now I want to ask myself, what is good about my current circumstance? Now, by the way, you can come up with really big, broad, good things, and they work. Jesus is with me no matter what, and it will be good. It is better if you land at very specific things. It's like a little nugget that you're going to take from the layer of truth and you're going to insert it right down here into your moment. So if your moment is, my children are driving me crazy and somebody's going to die, you felt that way, parent, right? Uh, How do you go up here and say, here's what's true about my kids who are a miracle and my great reward and a wonder to me, my spouse, whom I love and who was a miracle when I found them, who is an extraordinary human being. How do I bring that truth right down here and then go say, I'm sorry? You see, you have to carry a good thing from the true thing, and then you have to apply the good thing in the circumstance we're at. If it's just up here, then you've lived again in sort of the idea realm. Bring a good thing down here with you where you can do something good with it. The good carries into the current reality. I mean, by the way, the comforting words that we encourage one another with in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and he refreshes my soul. Those words are not written from green pasture and calm water. They are written, yea, though I am passing through the valley of the shadow of death. Here is what God has done. Here is what God will do. I am taking truth, and then I am grabbing something good, and I am bringing it into my current reality. Um, It is when Paul writes those words in Philippians 4, 6-9, do not be anxious about anything. He has just written these words about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus got sick, and he's sending him back to the church in Colossae. It says, God had mercy on him, and not only uh, on him, but also in me, pardon me, to Philippians, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. He says, therefore, I'm eager to send him to you. Why? That you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Right? In other words, here's, again, he's taking true and applying the good in his moment. He knows how to rely 
on God, who he is in the midst of life. Listen, if you will, to Psalm 71. As David talks about the true and the good in the midst of his real. He says, in you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. My enemies speak against me. Those who want to kill me conspire together. And they say God has forsaken him. Pursue him and seize him, for no one will rescue him. But as for me, I will always have hope. I will just praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, God, until I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, who is like you, God? What is true? What is good? And then I must leave you with, it. That, again, stop at with just what is true and what is good. But Christians, we are not meant to just survive in life. We are meant to thrive. We are meant to not get stuck in our moments, but we are meant to learn how to take the next step. And so having landed on what is true and what is good, the courage of what is true and what is good incites us to get up and take the next step. That we may not know everything that we need to do, but we may know the next thing that we need to do. Somebody came up to me after the first service and said, this is just like the new Frozen movie. You know, Do the next right thing. I'm like, hmm, I don't know if I wanted to hear that, but it's still true. I just want to say we can't, what happens is when we are dealing with our own stuff so much, sometimes we tend to get stuck and our whole Christian life is spent processing what's broken in us. And God has said, I want to learn to get you stood up and doing the next thing so that it is good for you and a blessing to the people I have sent you on a mission all around. He says, it doesn't, even if you have anxious thoughts, I've sent you to people all around you. Um, what is it? Proverbs 12, 25. Do I have that? It says, uh, look, uh, do we have that one, Polly? There we go. Uh, anxiety weighs down the heart. Again, we have this honesty about anxiety, but it says helps. But a kind word cheers it up. I think this is the simple news. You go out. Don't you think you could be the most honestly cheerful when you have empathy from your own experience or for understanding people who are around you? And that instead of a flippant word like be better, you say, I understand. I'm with you. I'm walking with you. Uh, here again, what is, here's what is true and good about you. Like that you might bring encouragement to those people. From true to good to next to a blessing to those who are around us. And I know that Christmas is a busy season. And I think that anxiety might just be an honest part of it. You can't pack this many things into it and not have it be a little anxious. And we hope that what we're giving you is just simple ways for you to land in the midst of those realities. But I want to leave you with one other simple idea today. If you will walk with Jesus in what is true and good and next, you might even find your anxiety can be a gift. Because Christians are meant to be gentle and humble and soft and I find that when I am honest with Jesus about the broken anxiety inside of me, it allows me to be weak and him to be strong. And then I find myself experiencing a great gift that instead of being self-assured about all things, I go about the work that he has called me to with a gentleness that comes from my own obvious brokenness. I think that a soft but brave human operating under the conviction of mission may be one of the most powerful agents for good in this world. 
I want you to hear 2 Timothy 1 7. It's familiar for the Spirit of God. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self discipline, which is so true. I also want you to hear Psalm 103. God knows who you are. Would you just let these words run over your heart? Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear Him and His righteousness with their children's children. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who do His bidding, who obey His word. Praise the Lord, all His heavenly hosts, you servants who do His will. Praise the Lord, all His works everywhere and all of His dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Amen. Thanks for connecting with Hillcrest Church. For more info on this and other sermons, visit us online at hcbellingham.com or join us at 9 or 11 a.m. any Sunday morning, 1400 Larrabee Ave, Bellingham, Washington.